A lot of people see justice as the most futile thing you can do with your life. Give your life completely to business and you see the money piling up. Be a health nut, eat right, go to the gym, and your muscles will grow and your body will look good and you'll see results. But when it comes to justice, it seems like you just can't get ahead. You patch up one hole and something else rips open. You bring peace to one region and war breaks out in another. You rebuild after an earthquake and a tsunami hits. And you work and you work and you work and there's never any profit. There's no bank where you can store a surplus amount of justice in. Stability is never permanent. Something always tips and people always ask, is it even worth it? And that question Though understandable, it's, I mean, quite frankly, it's ridiculous. And it rarely comes from those who are actually tired from pursuing justice and not just tired of the idea. It rarely comes from people who labored for years and have good reason to ask it. And you know what they never ask? Those type of people become friends with those who suffer. Family even. Because it's one thing to wonder if someone else's freedom is worth fighting for. But when you begin to identify with that someone else, commune with them, that's when the question is no longer worth asking. That's when it becomes offensive even. What do you mean, is it worth my time? That doesn't even deserve an answer. I don't care how long it takes. I don't care how many times you fail. I don't care how little progress is made. You never stop fighting for your own. Thank you, Dr. Ryan, Dr. Boss, Annalise. Wonderful to be here. It's an honor. Uh, that voice, those words belong to Micah Bournet, who will be here tomorrow night, 9 p.m., the Beamer Center to do a poetry slam with Ethan Butler, whom I'm told was a finalist on The Voice just this past couple of weeks. So tomorrow night, 9 p.m., right here at Wheaton. The Justice Conference next year in Chicago, June 5th and 6th, Cornell West, uh, Louis Giglio, Wren Collective, David Crowder, Bob Goff, next year in Chicago. Now, I don't know what you think about Cornell West and David Crowder, but uh, they're very different people, but they have the same hair. <laughs> now, if you bring Micah Bornet into that, if you've seen him, he's got the same hair too. So June 5th next year and 6, the only place you can see three, Afro, three Afros, one place. Right here in Chicago. Justice 24-7, it was my wife, Belinda, who's here. <laughs> Love of my life. She's a mentor to me. She twisted my arm and said, we need to go do something for the world. I said, why not the youth group down the road? She said, how about Africa? I said, no, for three years. Third year, I said, hey, we got a break. I was working at a big company. We can go for six months. Let's do it now. We did it. We went, well, it was meant to be six months. We stayed six years. And it was an, an incredible six years of our lives. Everything changed. We call it our second conversion, the first to Jesus Christ, the second to the suffering of the world. Everything changed for us. Born in Wisconsin, middle class, I honestly didn't have a clue what was happening in the wonderful country of South Africa when I was young. I had to learn later, your struggle, your fight. But Africa changed us more than we changed it. I became friends with some Africans, took some time. There's an honor culture there. Once you develop those relationships, they can be uh, robust and strong. And when you ask the question, tell me what you think, they'll say what they think. And I heard things I didn't want to hear. Well, Stephen, we know you're well-intended and your heart is great, but when you say this and when you do this, it feels like this to us. We feel like we're objects on the outside and you're in the inside helping us to do something. Why can't we, as Africans, find a way to rise up and do it ourselves? Can you help us? So I left Africa with my wife a little bit disillusioned. Little did we know back here in the U.S., something remarkable was happening. Justice was becoming mainstream. And you know that because you're living it now. You can buy something red. You can do something for HIV AIDS. You can tweet abolition and do something for 
trafficking. Justice was becoming this big thing, and there were people and names like Bono and even Oprah Winfrey and others were jumping into this. And we thought, wow, our day has come. We're no longer having to sort of ring the bell off in the corner of the room, pay attention. It was actually happening live and center. Now, in the midst of that, there were some people, maybe some of you saying, you know what? It feels a little bit like too much hype and not enough reality. There must be something more than just the mission trip, as, as good as those things are. How do we do justice in a real way, not just the rhetoric? And so we sh I shifted what I was saying. Thank God he convicted me. Stephen, don't dumb it down. Don't make it easy, because it's not. So I went out to the university at the time a couple years ago, and I thought, yeah, I'm just going to give the hard message and see how it goes, see how it flies. We were at a university, walked into the auditorium. There are long boards lined up outside. Walked in, I said, justice is the hardest thing you're going to do in your whole life. Pick one thing, go after it, give your lives fully to it, and don't stop. And when it gets hard, press in further. Why? Because the people that we serve are worth it. I was amazed at the response. I was amazed. People rose. This is what we want. Tell us. Another Kosa man, Mandela, he said, poverty is man-made, and we can do something about it. We can defeat it. Sometimes it takes a generation, and you can be that great generation. And then there's these verses tucked in the Bible that don't let us off the hook. We may think, you know what, it's too hard, it's too complicated, we're not going to do hype. Yeah, but you know what's required of you? You've got to act justly. You've got to walk humbly, you've got to love mercy. If you believe in me, you'll do these great things and you'll do even greater things than me, Jesus said. Hey, no, it wasn't you that chose me. I chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Can we change the world? Yes, yes, we can change the world, but we have to change how we change the world. We have to do it entirely differently. We have to push beyond the rhetoric, let the hype roll out, more people involved, but once you get in the door with your friends, there's got to be something deeper, something more. We can change the world, but we have to change how we change the world. What are some of those things? Let me just give you a sample. One of them is this, we need to humanize the poor. We need to humanize the person that we often think of as the victim. There's a professor out at Princeton who did some studies on how people respond to pictures of poor people or homeless people. So she did the study, she put pictures in front of people and people looked at it and she measured their brain waves, neuroimaging sort of technology. And she found something extraordinary. She found something very convicting, that people, when they see a poor person, respond, the brain waves are the same way we respond to an object, not a human being. We see them as them, objects, not people. Now, I mentioned Bono, and Bono has taken a lot of trips to Sub-Saharan Africa. I don't know him, but friends of friends do. And on one of those trips, he was walking through a village. And if you've been out there anywhere in the world, you realize that it's kind of like when kids play soccer, they don't know how to play yet. All the kids just follow the ball around the field. It's like a little cluster. Well, that's what it's like when you go to one of these beautiful villages where there's just a cluster of people. And so there's Bono with a cluster of kids and then his entourage on the periphery. And he stopped. And he looked at one of the kids, a little boy, and he put his hand on his head. And these are the words he said. Isn't he royal? Isn't this child royal? And the friend of the friend of the friend that relayed the story to me never forgot that phrase. Why? Because this is no longer a kid who's poor or a victim. He's actually royalty. Something high lofty, beautiful. When Jesus says, when you do something for the least of these, you do it for me, he was saying the same thing. Isn't that person royalty? 
So it's not until we move beyond seeing those who suffer as objects, sort of contempt, sometimes scorn, or, oh, we just need to throw a dollar to that person, I feel guilty. It's not until we lift them up to their feet and look at the homeless person and say, hey, what's your name? Where are you from? How was your day? Yeah, we could talk about money too, but I want to know about you. Suddenly, that person is no longer an object, but a person. Once we do that, the whole thing changes. We need to humanize the poor. Secondly, we need to redefine the problem. Now, what's been happening in the justice conversation is very profound because it's not just new people getting involved. In the theological circles, justice is being recovered. The biblical idea of justice is being recovered. For so long, we thought justice was just making something wrong right, giving what is due. And there's a word in the Old Testament that basically says that. But there's another word in the Old Testament that means justice too. And it means right relationships. It means how I'm related to my brothers and sisters in South Africa. How am I related when I was a youth and I didn't know about apartheid? How you're related to your roommate. Is that relationship just? Reframing the problem away from just making, fixing something to actually right relationships changes everything as well. I was in a meeting in Washington, D.C., and it was a meeting with a few senators, and we were talking about foreign aid, and uh, it was with a bunch of faith leaders. The gentleman who came in late was an Orthodox rabbi. And he came in late. We were each taking a turn to talk to these senators about why we believe the United States should continue funding foreign aid because it helps people who are on the margins. And he said these words. I've never forgotten it. He said the root word for mercy and justice in our language in the Hebrew tradition is the same. I've thought about that for months, now years. What does that mean? Well, Tzedakah, which is justice, and hesed, which is love, same root word. We can do justice. We can act justly. But as Mother Teresa said, justice without love is really not justice at all. She also said love without justice is not love. Cannot just do justice. We have to act it out, live it out in the context of love. Mercy and justice go together. You cannot separate them. Suddenly it looks like the essence of the gospel that the gospel is turning people upside down, head to toe, soul along the way. The question of word and deed, evangelism or justice, is a false dichotomy. We need to reframe the problem. Thirdly, we need to live justice, not just do it. Justice 24-7. When I travel, I get this question most often. What can I do? Stephen, what can I do? My team, who is here, what question we often get the most? What is it that I can do? And it is a valid and lively question. We should never stop asking it, but I've never once gotten the question, who must I become? Who must I become to act justly? I referred to Belinda as one of my mentors. I've also sought teachers on the margins and on the edge. And so living in Africa for me was a way to learn and to understand. And I still consider my most important teachers African brothers and sisters, some of whom we've lived, lived with, some of them we've met over the years. And one of them is a woman named Charlene, who I met just last year. She's from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And if you haven't been following that story. It's the poorest country in the world. It's up there with South Sudan. It's the worst place in the world to be a mother. It's also the worst and most dangerous place to be a woman. Some people call it the rape capital of the world, and there's fighting militias, and there's a failed state, and there's greed at the heart of it because all the stuff that's in our cell phones, coltan and tin and tantalum, they come, much of it comes from the Congo. So it's a complex problem. There I meet Charlene, who walks into a room, and people stand up and applaud. 
She carries a presence that's just glorious and beautiful. I say to myself, who is this woman? What is her story? She volunteers her story. She fled a village because a rebel militia invaded them. She saw her husband get murdered. She had to gather her family, her kids, and flee the village under the cover of night. Not once, but not twice, three times, she's raped by these militias, one of them by soldiers that were supposed to protect her. And the culture, her culture, is when a baby is born from rape, that child is rejected, orphaned, not included, not considered part of any tribe. She does the opposite. She said, this child is my own. His name will be David. He'll be given the same treatment as my other kids. She flees to a refugee camp outside of Goma, the eastern capital of the country, and she begins to rebuild a life. She starts a small business for her own family, and she helps her sisters do the same. She begins to work on a process of forgiving those perpetrators. She, she says she's forgiven them, and she's helping her sisters do the same. Now she's working on ways to prevent the violence, stop the violence. When Charlene walks into a room, people stand up and applaud. And I think, well, if she is anything but helpless. She's anything but someone over there that just, you know, give a dollar and don't bring me there. She's a modern day hero, someone that we can learn from. She's not only talking about faith, but living it out. She's reframed the problem, her relationship to us, her relationship to her sisters. Justice for her is a very different thing than justice is for us. So on the plane ride home, I asked myself, gosh, this woman whose faith towers above mine, what is it that I have to learn? How do I live justice? Not just a mission trip, but if I'm thinking about the world, why not think about people right here in DuPage County in Wheaton? We have an office just down the road. Emily leads it. And we have Iraqis and Congolese coming in on a regular basis. If you want to meet someone, one of these kind of people, have lunch, have dinner, meet them, hear their stories. It will change you. And as you are changed, then you might just bring a little change yourself. It's relationship. It's both ways. I asked myself, if I were she and she were me, would I be like her? Would I have the faith, the strength to do what she is doing? What if she were you and you were she? I wrote these words in my journal on the way home. What if she were you and you were she? Would she plunge her heart and mind and soul into the complexity? Would she seek to understand the war, the poverty, the suffering? Would she risk her happy pursuit for empathy? Or would she take one look and gasp and say, oh, please, no more. I can't bear it. I cannot. My heart cannot take the suffering. Would she flee? No. Mm-mm. No. -uh. No way. If she were you, she would dive headlong into the milieu, the suffering. She would shake her fist. She would shout. She would scream. She would confront those ever-looming jaws of doubt. She would not forget. No, instead, she would shake her hand against those who prognosticate, who sophisticate, who debilitate, who lay down bricks of impossibility and tether her own freedom to those not free. She would celebrate only when they emancipate if she were you and you were she. Whatever you do for the least of these, you and I do it for Jesus. Justice, 24-7. Live it every day, every moment with your roommates, in your dorms, in your classes. Who's left out? What relationships are broken? Who's here that you don't see? Find them. Let's pray. Father, we want to live justice. We don't want to just do it. We want to live it out of our hearts, out of our guts, from the bottom of our feet. 
to the top of our heads. Give us that courage, that strength to live biblical justice, what you've called us to. We know what you require of us to act justly, to live it 24-7, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our brothers and our sisters, to elevate those who suffer, to see them rise and become heroes and change the earth. And we can sit back and celebrate and clap our hands and say, well done. It's an honor to join you. In your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.